So some some information before we start. Um, yesterday um, we had indeed a, a very interesting discussion. Um, several speakers um, provided us with a lot of information uh, on topics as as ranging from science diplomacy to the role of um, business incubators uh, to support commercialization of space, uh, all the way to the impact of urbanization on precipitation. Uh, we have over 200 participants registered for this uh, workshop coming from 40 countries, and then 18 subject matter experts contributing uh, with their knowledge and experience to this event. Uh, thank you, very special thank you to Professor Young from uh, UT Austin, who co-leads this workshop and uh, helped us uh, shape the program. Uh, if you want an updated uh, version of the agenda, uh, please visit the website also for more information. Um, we'll be posting the or, or inserting the, the URL on the chat box for your reference. Uh, but make sure you, you go there and uh, if you have questions uh, about the, the schedule. So the overall objective of this workshop, again, and just a quick summary, is um, to discuss how we can make Earth observation mainstream and how we can make the community more diverse in order to achieve that objective of um, just bringing Earth observation to as many domains and as many applications as possible. Uh, we know that uh, most products or a lot of products are global products, and so it's a challenge for users to be able to use that information for their local needs and local applications. So that's what we're discussing here, and um, we'll continue to discuss it in the mainstreaming Earth Observation Working Group that we're launching uh, with this uh, workshop. We already have 188 people who signed up for this working group will continue to accept uh, new registrations. And the objective is to showcase you, showcase your work, your data products, your, your startup, your research institute or lab. We want to create tangible deliverables together with the community and connect both the research scientists and the um, users. Um, in order to create a, a more streamlined discussion and uh, um, to make sure we work towards that objective of making Earth observation mainstream. So we'll be um, also advertising uh, career opportunities, especially for early career uh, professionals. We want to increase diversity in this domain and we'll be opening also positions to co-chair the working group very, very soon. So expect an email from us um, in the next few days or a week um, with more information about this working group. We're very excited about it. And uh, we really want to work with you to make it a success. So enjoy the, the workshop the second day. Uh, I think we have a, a very good lineup of speakers. And um, without further ado, let's welcome Let's start the first session and let's welcome Tiago Ormigo. Um, Tiago Ormigo is the first speaker of the session and um, it's my pleasure to introduce him. Um, Tiago is, Tiago is the co-founder and head of space business development at Spinworks. He has a master's in aerospace engineering from the Technical University of Delft and a degree in aerospace engineering from Institut Superior Technic in Portugal. He specialized in automatic piloting of atmospheric re-entry trajectories on Mars and started his career as a Mars Express mission analyst at the European Space Agency. He has worked as an autopilot engineer on several missions and co-founded Spinworks in 2008, where he is currently responsible for business development in the space sector. He was also vice president of the Space Sector Commission in the AED cluster between two, 2021 and 2023. Thank you so much, uh, Tiag, and the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation, of course. I'm not sure if you, everyone can hear, but I had a few problems setting up the yes, room. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, 
So um, without further ado, the, let me just start the, my presentation. One moment. So um, this is just a, a, an example. This is uh, basically is a small presentation of our own company followed by um, an introduction to uh, uh, it was uh, an experiment that we did basically that uh, that became much of the much of the investment that we have been doing in the company for the last several years. Um, so but before I go into what all that is on the smart camera side, uh, I'll just go into a very, very, very brief presentation of our company. So next slide, please. Um, so basically, Spinworks is an aerospace company founded in 2006 uh, in Portugal. We have been, uh, so the, the company is wholly owned by, by, still wholly owned by the founders, which is a rarity in, in these uh, times. Um, and we have been able to gather a number of engineers to our, uh, to our team, um, around 30 at this point, uh, that have helped us in so many ways that we wouldn't have been able to, to make developments ourselves. So um, we have been part of European Space Agency missions since 2008. And in fact, this has been um, much of our income or revenue stream is coming from, from ESA since then. Uh, our involvement has been mostly in um, space exploration projects, mainly related to uh, atmospheric entry, uh, descent and, and power descent and landing uh, because of uh, our background as, as students. So most, most of the people involved in the company were originally studying either in guidance navigation control or in the, um, in the thermal uh, analysis aspects of uh, atmospheric entry. Um, it was a different time when ESA was really putting a lot of effort in, into developing reusable launch vehicles. That was 30 years ago, uh, for those who don't remember. Um, so the company was uh, basically from the very beginning quite multidisciplinary. Out of the six guys we had, we had three guys in a, in a guidance navigation control, and then we had uh, two in a structural design, a structural and thermal design, and we had um, another guy who was dedicated to to actually um, systems engineering. So um, it all made up for for a team that was able to do a complete system. Um, and this has been very helpful to us as we now try to develop things that are only apparently uh, less complicated than than a full vehicle such as smart cameras. So going on to the next slide, um, and this is basically the last slide I have just to to do a high level presentation. So uh, the company works in both upstream and downstream um, areas. One, uh, the upstream part of the company uh, is focused on guidance navigation control, in particular for ESA missions, but we have been uh, paying a lot of effort also to, to enter the space market in the US with, uh, with Eclipse program in particular for commercial lunar payload services. Uh, in the last several years, and this is the reason I'm 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 here is to I will be talking about this. Um, we have been developing optical instruments that are basically complementary to what we have been doing in uh, guidance navigation control, as well as able to uh, that, that have that were also um, that also made us able to enter the new space arena in a, in an entirely different uh, direction than we expected. And we have been mostly working, as I mentioned before, in the, in the missions related to lunar and planetary, lunar and planetary descent and landing. Just a moment. I, I will try to put my microphone a little bit further up so that you can hear me. Uh, okay. Can you hear me better than previously or? Yes, yes. Okay, can. great. So on the downstream part, uh, of the company, we have, uh, we have uh, developed our own drones to capture um, data, uh, capture data using the drones as well as satellite data. Um, and this has enabled us to, to work with several uh, partners in the fields of uh, precision agriculture, uh, forestry management, um, infrastructure monitoring, uh, and the maritime fields, as well as environmental uh, monitoring. So this is a high level of review. There's a lot that you will hear about these things as part of the presentation on, on the smart cameras. So I think we can move on to the next slide. So 
this is like the the milestones of the main milestones in the company uh, be, uh in the beginning we were basically focused on on getting uh, enough contracts uh, to to get the company company working uh, at some point we were able to uh, make an inaugural flight for our drones which were the initial focus for the company and as it, as time went on we were able to get a little bit further first in 2015 by leading the, being the first portuguese company to lead the uh, an ESA mission which was the asteroid impact mission uh, mission in in terms of guidance navigation and control and then uh, later on we became more focused in the practical aspects of uh, of developing technologies and testing them in the, in the field and that meant uh, map operations basically is map is our our application to our app that that basically gathers data enables some image processing and then delivers that data to our clients in the downstream field and then uh so that was in 2017 and then since then we have been focusing much more on new space including by developing a, a first cube set in 2018 and then Leading a CubeSat, uh, which is upgrade, basically one of the flagship projects in the uh, UT Austin Portugal program. Um, since then, we have been focusing quite a bit on on developing our cameras, as you can see there. I will go into more detail in the the next few slides. But the the idea is that by uh, March next year, February March next year, we'll have our own camera in space, and then. From there on, we have some other milestones to achieve that are related to getting things in, in space and actually getting to work with them. So next slide. Um, now, regarding our, our uh, main investment in the past several years, um, we were uh, working a lot with, uh, with Vision as part of the guidance navigation control system since uh, early on in the company's uh, uh, history, let's, let's put it this way. So we have been seeing that uh, guidance navigation control systems themselves are quite critical and uh, they're usually attached to the companies that are developing the spacecraft themselves. So it's a quite difficult market to get into uh, with the possible exception of things that haven't worked before in previous missions uh, that give us some room to develop specific technologies uh, related to GNC, but not the core GNC itself. Um, so, as we saw the space market value growing from 200 something billion into 400 billion, even though the communications and navigation um, still dominate and they are basically, um, there is some discussion as to whether this is actually space market or, or not, but let, let's, uh, let's say that it is. There is, uh, um, even then, there is a growing relevance of, of remote sensing applications, space servicing missions, um, and these are, are quite well served by by computer, computer vision. And I can go a little bit more into detail next. So as we see space launches growing um, extensively, even if we subtract the the, the impact of, of Starlink, which is the orange part of what you see on the top left or top right, right hand side, and the number of space launches is in, increasing and the number of satellites is also increasing quite markedly, especially for, uh, at this point, remote sensing uh, CubeSats or nanosatellites and small sets. Um, there will be, for the time being and for at least the, the next decade, even though there are some disruptions ahead, uh, namely by the SpaceX Starship, uh, which is on the right-hand side there, um, there will be constraints on, on, the, on, the, on the mass that can be uh, taken to orbit. Um, so uh, the robotic presence will continue to, to outnumber humans for, for a long time. And uh, one of the things that is key to, to enabling this, uh, this change is embedded data processing. It's a precondition for automation and computer vision is a, is a part of, of that. Uh, and one of the, some of the applications that we can, we can uh, envisage are relative and absolute navigation for in the vicinity of, of a natural, that would be a moon, uh, the moon, the Mars, uh, small objects, or man-made man, man -made objects such as spacecraft, uh, where we want to do a rendezvous. Um, so there is a, a the, the, the field of GNC right now is quite dominated by the need to have um, automated uh, rendezvous approach landing missions. And, and uh, for this, Computer vision is key. 
Um, in the same way, there is there's still a, quite a, a, a limit to the amount of data that we can send downwards, even though we have uh, increasingly more sophisticated uh, cameras on board. So we can collect a lot of data, but we need to send um, less data than we are able to collect because of the limitations there. Um, and so if we are able to do event detection or objects in some way, uh, classification, if we can, uh, if we can detect the trajectories that, that um, uh, sorry about that, I'll increase again. Uh, so if we can increase the, the, the ability to detect uh, events from space, uh, whether they are uh, wildfires, uh, pollution events or disasters, um, and if we can do a lot of the uh, astronomical observations uh, auto in an automated way, such as uh, what we have in, for currently with a mission, with some missions like Gaia, which are basically uh, mapping the entire uh, universe, then this is something that uh, computer vision has a large role in. And finally, if we are able to do a lot of the um, uh, tasks needed for mapping, including image stabilization, for instance, during the acquisition, um, or if we can do the whole uh, pipeline, such a, that includes image alignment, georeferencing, code registration between different images, et cetera, that would be really helpful. So uh, the way we saw it, uh, go on to the next slide, please. Um, the, the way we saw it is that if we go into uh, the business of uh, building all orbital, orbital cameras, then we are serving our, our own business because the uh, at some point, uh, ESA started selecting uh, the, the consortium that, that the one, the, each uh, invitation to tender, which is the ITT you see over there, and they began selecting those according to whether they had, as part of the consortium, camera providers. And, and that was one of the things that, that uh, you know, uh, caught our attention. And the involvement in ESA projects, so our own involvement changed over time, and it became more um, intensive towards the Ionics, by testing, etc. Um, and so because we had significant background in computer vision because, uh, due to the, to the need of incorporating that in, in DNC, then we, we thought that, that it would be a good option. The final thing that made it for us, um, uh, not even disregarding the new space, uh, is that it was a distinctive factor in national terms because in Portugal there was no provider for that at European level. Smart cameras are not really uh, all that uh, disseminated, so it was a. It sounded like a good idea to us. On top of that, we had uh, several opportunities coming in, and and uh, the opportunity to test cameras in orbit is is something that's really really valuable. It's not limited to the to the money that it costs. But uh, the opportunity itself is is uh, extremely valuable to showcase our capabilities. So um, in the new space, because onboard processing was necessary and a lot of the algorithms that that we foresee uh, working on board um, belong with the cameras. So the so they are part of the cameras and not necessarily uh, elsewhere. Then then we thought it was uh, a good idea to go into that. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what we did in the past few years. So these are the three uh, slides that basically say what we have been doing uh, for the last uh, for the last uh, seven years. So since 2016, we had an opportunity at that point in 2016, right around the time that we were thinking of what are we going to do about this, because it sounds like we have a good opportunity here. Then um, we were able to uh, reserve some space in a, in, a, in a satellite that was being uh, developed in Portugal for a multispectral camera, similar to the, the one that at that time uh, Planet was using in its own CubeSats. So uh, there was a lot of initial effort because we had limited background. We had most of the background um, coming from ESA projects, including sensor and processing electronics development, but we had relatively uh, little background, no background in some, some re other respects. So this project that lasted until 2020 was key to for us to, to test the waters, to, to see whether we were able to do this uh, sort of development. Then in 2019, uh, the, uh, we had an opportunity to actually launch a camera that could be used for um, one of the key uh, targets for Portuguese um, space, uh, space strategy, which is the Atlantic Constellation. And we were invited to develop a camera that could be used for maritime observation. And, and at that time, we, did, we, we thought 
of alternatives that involved more uh, multispectral cameras. We came down, we actually selected a hyperspectral camera because we thought that there was a lot more interest in, in that at the, initially at least, uh, before we, we know which exact bands are actually useful for a certain uh, for a certain parameter to be detected, um, we probably will need hyperspectral cameras. And then, as time goes on and we learn more about the the, the problem, we change over to to specific bands in a multispectral camera that might be easier to to work with. So at that point, we we knew that we had the, the right sensors. We had selected them uh, previously. For a, for the infant multispectral camera, um, and we only had to to modify very slightly the the processor board that we had. We had to modify lenses and and we had to change quite a bit in the image processing, but that was more the kind of thing that that we were able to do. Um, so the the main thing that changed and and that that focused our minds in the intervening years were uh, the need for doing to do flight tests and to to do a lot of calibration. In order to verify the performance we would have in our in orbital conditions. Next slide. And so the the last few years have been um, uh, quite different uh, to the first few years. So right now, because we have the hyperspectral camera that is currently, as you see on the lower right hand side, the, our uh, our partners Edisoft, they are leading currently a, a CubeSat. And uh, they allowed us to, to place our own hyperspectral camera on top of the of the CubeSat. And as you see on the right hand side, this is the the, the CubeSat that's being ready to to fly in the coming uh, months. So February, March. And in parallel, we developed a, a number of different systems that I think will expand quite significantly the the reach that the company has in this market. So star tracker, high resolution cameras, thermal infrared cameras and then other things that are more complicated. So introducing the kind of algorithms that make them smart and not just uh, simple cameras. Um, so right now where we are, um, we are on the verge of the first launch into orbit. Um, we are um, industrializing the, the production of these cameras and the, building a small series uh, of them in the coming years. Uh, we are developing an API for, for people to, to, to make it easier for uh, people coming into our company now uh, to, to work with the cameras. And, and we are uh, elaborating the product side to, and, and uh, entering the new space components markets that are uh, available uh, globally. Um, we are also expanding quite a bit the real world uh, use case demonstrations and you can go on to the next slide. And that's the final one. So basically where we are today is uh, we are um, we have accumulated a, a number of developments that uh, have placed us quite close to, to the market. We have a hyperspectral camera that's ready to launch, a Star Tracker that's basically the, shares a lot of things with the hyperspectral camera. There's some onboard software that's still needed there, uh, but we expect to have a lot of first launch uh, within one to two years at most. And then we have a thermal infrared camera that, and then a high resolution camera that are at different points in the development. In parallel to this, and this is another thing that's quite important to us, uh, we are currently developing the terrain relative navigation and the hazard detection and avoidance systems for a, an ESA mission to the moon. And the reason I, I, I mentioned this is that the, both terrain relative navigation and hazard detection and avoidance are key functions that are enabled by computer vision and that we can test, as you can see, the eightieth data acquisition, so the middle line over there, is an example of what we were able to do with the cameras that we developed in the scope of an ESA project that prepares um, GNC technologies using computer vision. So we are seeing more and more the convergence of what we have learned uh, using cameras, as was our uh, original intention, with, um, with the business that we already had on one hand, and also with the business that we want to have in the future. So currently we are developing eight cameras, for the Atlantic Constellation, we hope to have the first one of them probably in 2025. And in parallel to this, we are, we have been in talks with other customers to build more of these uh, hyperspectral cameras as well as star tracker units. Um, and so this is a just a, a short summary of what of uh, what we have done in a specific field for commercialization of of space. It's limited to our own um, vision of of the problem, which is basically the 
the, the business we were in gave us this opportunity and uh, currently it's still in the phase of development, although it's getting to the point where we are seeing it flying uh, in the coming months. So I think that's basically it, what I had for you. Sorry to take a little bit longer than, than you might expect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tiago. Uh, this was a very, very interesting uh, presentation. And um, we we will probably have some, some questions during the Q&A um, session, which will follow the next uh, two speakers. Um, so the next speaker uh, in this first session of uh, today is um, George uh, Cunha. Uh, George Cunha is the manager of the Earth Observation and Geospatial Information Unit at Talish Evisoft Portugal. He holds a degree in Physical Geography, GIS, and Geospatial Engineering. Jorge is a certified project manager with a certification from the International Project Management Association and has six, has six years of experience in this role. His expertise lies in Earth observation, remote sensing, and GIS. At Talish Edisoft, he has been working to develop maritime domain awareness services, a field in which Talish Edisoft has been active for 15 years. George also holds a GeoInt Geospatial Intelligence accreditation from the United States Geospatial Intelligence Foundation and actively participates in the Young Professionals Working Group within the United States Geospatial Intelligence Foundation. George, thank you so much for uh, joining us today and the floor is yours. Hi, Vasco. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um... As Vasco was saying, uh, I'm the manager of the Earth Observation and Geospatial Information Unit here uh, at Taos Edison. So wanted to give you a quick, so suppose that I'm not, not sharing the slides, right? Uh, not yet. Okay. Can you see it now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so I uh, want to give you just uh, a brief presentation of the company. So Taos is of Portugal. Uh, it is a, a Taos Group company. So as shareholders, they, we have uh, Taos with 65% uh, of, the, of the company. And then there is a participation also of uh, NAV and the DD de Portugal, which belongs to the Ministry of Defense. Uh, so uh, these are uh, our the, uh, our our areas here at the company. So we work with naval systems, land defense systems, air, uh, aerospace mobility solutions, uh, cyber and identity security, and aerospace uh, and security, which is the the unit that uh, that is the to space it to which I belong. So uh, our headquarters are located in, in Oeiras, uh, close to Lisbon. And uh, we are we also operate uh, a teleport in, in Santa Maria as well. Uh, so uh, I'm here to, to introduce you to our, our product, which is a, a product that we develop for maritime domain awareness solutions. So, and, and uh, it is mainly using uh, space-based access for, for, for these this activities. So, uh, just an overview of what we've been doing here. And so, uh, we, have, uh, we have this solution that uh, where we are able to provide services on a 24-7 basis uh, in all weather and, and all weather operations. And uh, there is a list of some of the of the products that we are currently delivering to our to our customers. So uh, this solution, uh, it uh, these are the communities that we are currently providing services on a daily basis. So through through the European Maritime Safety Agency, which we have a, a operational contract. We are, uh, let's say, feeding these communities with uh, with uh, with this kind of product. So, uh, currently, we have more than six hundred end users uh, through all these communities, such as the Clipsinet, uh, Copernicus Maritime Surveillance, 
and also the Frontex Maritime Services. So our current capability, we are able to downlink data from, directly from the satellite, of course, through the, the operation of the, of the teleport, which I already mentioned. Uh, we are also have there all the all the the hardware capability that allows us to convert the the raw data from the satellites all the way to to the image data, and then we uh, also have our our um, or we we call it analysis tool, which allows us uh, to uh, to generate value added products and. Uh, and then deliver these the, this products to our uh, to the end users, uh, and it currently uh, is tested with the maximum delivery time of the products since the, the satellite data acquisition to the end users of uh, uh, twenty minutes. So currently, uh, these services uh, these are the, the the sensors that we are using for the the provision of these services. So. Well, on the SAR side, we have uh, we have uh, the ISI constellation, RadarSat 2, which belongs to MDA, and of course, uh, Sentinel-1. Sentinel uh, since this, the last year, let's, I would say, uh, we also start the provision of this type of services also based on optical sensors. And these optical sensors that we are using are uh, uh, are sensors from the, the Aros constellation, which belongs to uh, the ImageSat International, which is a company from Israel, and of course, uh, the Portuguese satellite operator Geosat, uh, which are the operators of Geosat 2 satellite. So, this is one of our products. So, uh, it is uh, what we call vessel detection and vessel traffic monitoring. So, uh, we are uh, mainly it is detecting vessels from the, the satellite imagery, and then correlate them with the with the IS data, uh, and this allows us also to identify some we call it potential. Dark, I like to call it okay, potential dark activities at the sea. So, which is uh, what you are seeing at the top on the top right of the of the slide, which is an example of this detection with the, with the orange color is a detection with the, with the SAR image, and then the correlation with IS and the identification of a possible dark activity. This, uh, this allows us to do some special analysis and uh, we uh, are able to identify certain areas uh, in which this, uh, this kind of activities are, uh, let's say, occur more often. So this is another product that we develop here. It's quite a, a recent one here. So which is uh, the, the anomaly detection and behavior analysis. So these are some uh, artificial intelligence algorithms uh, in which we uh, expose the algorithm to, uh, to the IS data on a, on a given area of interest. And the, the algorithm is able to learn the normal patterns uh, occurring on this even area. And from then on, if something happens that is not, let's say, normal for that given area, it then pops up some alert message uh, identifying some, some, be some behaviors or not normal behaviors for, for, that, for, that, um, for that area of interest, let's say. Uh, this is another uh, another data source that we are using for the provision of these ser the services, which uh, kind of on the, the test phase it's not uh, on the, it's not ready for a let's say operational service, but we are testing it, which is the the radio radio frequency signal detection or RFG or as we used to call. This is really interesting because uh, they uh, they allows us to 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 acquire a wide uh, um, a wide coverage uh, on a single collection window. It can go to eight million square kilometers on, on certain with certain bandwidths uh, and uh, using this large area that we uh, that we. Uh, 
that we acquire the data, we we are able to to perform some tip, tip and queue services, which is the task of uh, a satellite imagery for a given area where we have the identified or classified uh, a radar signal with the um, let's say some suspicious activity or from some activity that uh, we find that is not normal, such as, such as uh, like the IS proofing or so on. Uh, this is another product, but it's mainly for, for environment, environmental monitoring, which is, uh, uh, this. it's not really just one product, it's almost two, pro two products one of which is the oil spill detection, which is the one that you are seeing on the left side, uh, just identifying the, the, the large spills or you know, small spill, spills on the, on the satellite imagery. Then we also uh, are able to identify also through the analysis of the IAS signals and also the detections that we made with the vessel detector and to identify the possible sources of these spills. And this is a, a new product, which is the oil thickness and volume estimation, which uses uh, which uses optical imagery to estimate the, the thickness and also the the volume of uh, of uh, a given spill. So uh, it uses uh, a convention for for the class for the descriptions and, the, and also the classification. And the, those, this, this convention allows us to identify or to estimate the liters per square kilometer that was built on this given. Uh, another product that we uh, deliver on a, on a regular basis, mainly uh, focus on, on the, the using of, of the SAR imagery, is the, the wind and wave, uh, which is uh, the, the wind speed and direction and wave with estimations, uh, which is uh, a really interesting product for supporting uh, navigation. And uh, on the service delivery side, uh, which is the, the information that the end, user, the, the end user is able to contact with. So uh, it depends on the, on the end user, of course, and on their uh, level of expertise. But we are able to currently to deliver uh, service products based on, uh, on, on PDFs, let's say, report formats, uh, normal GIS standards. Uh, also, we have developed some um, some APIs for 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 ingestion of the product that we are we are we are able to to, do, to pro produce. Uh, and of course, uh, we also have uh, uh, web web-based platforms for for delivery of the of the products. We have developed also uh, a plugin QGIS, which is more uh, to to allow a certain give a certain end user to produce the, their their own services or. To, is to install the capabilities for, for it to, to use its own service chain, let's say. Finally, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, these this products or these operations are all based in, in the Azores. We have a strategic position for this. So we cover almost, uh, almost really, we, we cover all our Z, Z, uh, EZ area. Um, and it also gives us uh, a really advantageous uh, position over the, the North Atlantic area. So uh, within this footprint that uh, is the capability of, of the antenna, we are able to, to de deliver these products in real time, uh, test, currently tested in less than 20 minutes, uh, everything from from satellite and link all the way to to the, the value added products we are all, all, we are able to customize these products according to to the end user requirements of course and it has a 24 7 basis of operation 
and uh, we are able to deliver all this uh, independently or, or all day you know when in, in all weather conditions uh, so this is uh, uh, an overview of the teleport in Santa Maria uh, and I will leave the floor to my colleague Joel Neves to give you a detailed description of what we have been doing here. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, George. Uh, actually, next speaker uh, is João Neves, also from from uh, Edisoft. Um, João Neves uh, uh, graduated from the Portuguese uh, Naval Academy and later from the Institute Superior Technic, where he earned his Master's of Science and also PhD in Electronics and Computers. He served in the Navy uh, in several roles, including Head of Weapons and Electronics Department uh, aboard the Vastigama Frigate. And he was a project manager at the Portuguese Ministry of Defense and later joined uh, Talish Edisoft as uh, aerospace manager. Joel, the floor is yours. Uh, I think you're muted. Uh, I'm not supposed to. Oh, okay. I can hear you. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. Uh, once again, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for. Yes, we can. We can see it. Okay. Uh, well, uh, 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 sorry, Joel, uh, your sound is uh, breaking up a little bit. Connection. Uh, I don't know if I can do too much about it. So can you listen to me better now? Yes, a lot better. Yeah, thanks. So, and I will talk a little bit uh, about Thales and the soft uh, Portugal activities in ground and space. So, my, my colleague, George, on space uh, regarding our activities. Um, so, I will not talk too much about this because George also already mentioned. Um, so, we work here at the aerospace um, area the aerospace area includes ground systems uh space uh, uh João, uh, i'm i'm really sorry uh we're not being able to to hear you i would suggest that maybe you can try to reconnect log in again um and uh and see if we can solve it uh that way um I will try to do it very fast. Give me just a few seconds. Sorry. Okay, okay, thank you. So in the, in the meantime, we will uh, take the, the, the chance to uh, ask some questions to our previous speakers, uh, Tiago, Ormigo, and also Jorge Cunha. And one of the questions we have is, um, what are the, the traffic thresholds for uh, detection and how image resolution affects uh, the detection of, of the ships. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, that's a point. Uh, of course, image resolution uh, affects uh, a lot of the, de the detections, especially um, if you were trying to locate, uh, or say, small vessels or small boats, uh, that, that's uh, really, really difficult. Uh, to address that problem, we are currently trying, together with, uh, with EyeSight, to use their video capabilities in order to be able to identify, to identify small, small boats, uh, especially because uh, the, the the Azores region it uses to has a, a, a problem with smuggling and and, <clears throat> and we are trying to to fix to, to solve this problem uh, with this with this capability. So, uh, but since we are we are 
we are feeding the, the, the Copernicus Maritime Services. Uh, most of our services, they are, they are, or most of our products, they are produced based on, on setting down one d image, images, which is a, a sensor that uh, the, the resolution it, it is not uh, so proper to identify such kind of, uh, uh, of, uh, of boats, like small boats or, or so. But still, uh, it, it, uh, it, uh, everything has to do with the price that the, the customer is willing to pay for, for the services. So, uh, and of course, uh, it also has something to do with the, with the customer requirements and what they are trying to identify. So if you are trying to, to manage fleets, let's say, or fleets of uh, boats that are used for, for, for containers or so, uh, the I think that the, the resolution of the image is not such a big issue for this. Okay, thank you. And uh, we have a question also for for Tiago. Uh, so we see the use of of drones uh, and also uh, satellite data, uh, including the sentinels uh, on your solutions. So how how to bridge the gap between both? How how do you work with your customers? To provide services mm -hmm. that, um, yeah. That so the, this uh, typically is is uh, has been an issue over time for for quite a bit uh, because satellites weren't able to produce images uh, bridging the, the distance between what is the norm, which is Copernicus uh, at ten meter per pixel, and the kind of data that we have, uh, which basically ends up producing maps <clears throat> that are at ten centimeter per pixel. However, the, the last generation of, of satellites is, is now uh, much more capable. And so we are finding that uh, images that are around 30 centimeter per pixel can now be uh, sourced from, uh, from providers. And so um, right now we, we are able to fully bridge um, in terms of the panchromatic uh, imagery. Um, for multispectral imagery, the resolution is not uh, is not that high. Uh, so we use um, data that that probably is still not what we would like it to be, especially in areas uh, in bands where we can uh, we can extract important imagery for our clients. So there a lot of uh, a lot has been made over time, uh, but right now we still have, um, in terms of spectral data, we still lack some high resolution uh, imagery. Okay. Uh, and now maybe a question for both. I still can see uh, João, so I think we're, we'll take the, the this extra few minutes for another question. Um, so the, the the cost can be an issue for, for a lot of users. Uh, so how, how can we... Uh, and even though Copernicus data is, is free, but for the, the high resolution data, including drone data, there is a cost inherent to, to the acquisition and, and, and the services. So how can we uh, work with the users um, and, and make sure we, we mainstream Earth observation um, with okay. this so cost? On, on our side, if I got it right, so on, on our side, what we're seeing is that the even the 30 centimeter per pixel data is being provided at a very competitive cost relative to what, what we can get from drones. Uh, this is because they are able to gather uh, very, very large areas uh, with each image. Um, and so, I mean, basically we are seeing images that uh, a single image can cover a number of different areas of interest for us, where especially in areas where we work in the Douro River with the vineyards, uh, we can collect data for several uh, farms at a time. So that that that's also an advantage. So we don't have to do um, different flights to gather data that is high resolution enough uh, for that. But with drones, we can still um, we can still isolate each plant and provide data on a plant by plant basis, which is not something that we expect to be able to achieve using satellites. Um, so uh, th there is still some some ground to be made that we don't expect satellites to do, and spectral data, really high resolution uh, spectral uh, data, is is still lacking.
Um, are you muted, Vasco? I am. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so the same question, uh, George, and also, uh, um, do, you, do from your experience, are, are users uh, willing to pay and and uh, aware of the advantages of Earth observation uh, um, and integrate that data into their operations? Okay, uh, it's really difficult. Uh to do business within this uh, maritime uh, activities because uh, mainly uh, we work or, or the interest for for uh, of these services it comes from from agencies such as AMSA or some other agencies that are not in Europe let's say uh, and I can tell that sometimes the the even though they 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 uh, they have these competitive tenders, of course, but normally they are quite aware of the costs uh, of setting up a services like this, or all the uh, all the way to to get access to the antenna, get access also to to the satellites, and how much or what is the cost for us to install the the ground capability to be able to process th this these images. But if we are not talking uh, uh, about uh, this kind of agencies which are aware of, uh, of what is required for, for the services, uh, if we are going, let's say, for, for a Navy or a, a local Navy, uh, it's really hard to, to give them a perspective of what is required for, for provision of, of these services. What is what is on the on the back end? All the all the, the equipment that is on the back end. What is ne really necessary? And of course, uh, soon as they they start to figure out what what is required, uh, I, I feel that they lost their interest because it starts to be uh, really expensive for 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 uh, for for setting up the services for our operational. Uh, operational basis that is required for the Navy, for instance. Uh, it's kind of hard to make this kind of services mainstream because, uh, and we are talking about maritime domain, so uh, we are able to, to track a, a ship on a given area with a satellite imagery, but we are not able to do the same on the next imagery to track the same, the same, uh, the same ship. For, to, to say. It's really hard, it's really hard to to make the customers to understand what the requirements and what is needed for for setting up a, 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 a services like this, and of course, uh, and we are not talking about uh, the resolution because as soon as we uh, we stop providing services using using. Uh, the Copernicus uh, capabilities, and we go through a high resolution uh, sensors. Uh, the the price of the service, or prices for each service, it increase a lot. And uh, and, and of course, the local agencies or uh, some navies or so on, they lost their interest. Even I think the only interesting is is uh, on uh, on the agency side because they managed to put together. Uh, all the all the end users and they are able to together the, the the sufficient funding for these activities. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we have Joan F uh, again online. Let's see if uh, uh, it works this time. I hope so. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, can you hear me better now? Yes, much better. Okay, I'm sorry because it seems that there was a conflict with my camera, so I will not yes. turn on my camera. Um, so it's useless for you to see me too. <laughs> so, okay, I will uh, continue my presentation. I don't know if you want me to go back. Uh, I don't know how, how bad was it before or if I can continue from- I, I think you can continue, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay so continuing and trying not to take too long because I, we are already delayed. Um, so, in, in the flight software systems area, um, this is basically our portfolio, uh, what we do. Uh, so space segment technology, um, space ground segment technology development too. So uh, EGSE, uh, SCOE, uh, mission control systems, payload, 
also the space space mission studies, uh, namely with nano satellite mission definition and integration, and also in the area of aeronautics. So we call this area uh, flight software systems. Uh, it, it applies not only for uh, space flight systems, but also aeronautics, uh, where we do some systems integration, retrofit, um, avionics and client support, and defense mission systems development too. Um, on, on the right side of the screen, you can see a few missions that uh, we support, but I will talk about this later. One of our main products uh, at uh, Thales Edisoft is uh, RTEMS. RTEMS has been evolving since 2006 uh, with the uh, ESA Portuguese task, task Force. Um, we have gathered a lot of technical expertise in, in RTEMS um, and we developed since then uh, some support tools for RTEMS. Um, ESA has been a huge uh, sponsor to this, so RTEMS has, has evolved until today, um, we have qualified our TEMS uh, in 2014, um, and uh, it is qualified for flight uh, systems, flight space systems. And currently, uh, our TEMS is flying on board of several, and I will show you after, uh, several satellites. Um, maybe the most sounding ones are the Galileo satellites, uh, which almost, I think, almost of them. Uh, all of them uh, use the um, RTEMS on board. Um, okay, so RTEMS improvement uh, was, as the name says, an improvement of the initial RTEMS version. Um, it, it has been pre-qualified for real-time operational system for critical missions. Um, it is used as a Galileo software standard, uh, level B. Uh, so it is not qualified uh, for um, manned uh, or human um, missions, but uh, unmanned missions only. So satellites or any spacecraft that doesn't have uh, people on board. Uh, it can be qualified for DAL A too. So, uh, but uh, till the moment we are, let's say we are on the process. Um, we have uh, a complete knowledge of all uh, the software lines of, of RTEMS. Um, every, I can tell you that every line is thoroughly documented, um, although it is an open source for embedded systems. Uh, so we, and it's applied to uh, real time, hard real time. Um, on, on, on the right side of the screen, you can see uh, some space missions where it has been used. Uh, so as you can see, uh, lots of them. Uh, we work a lot with European companies and uh, European agencies, uh, but also, for instance, the, the Compsats are from the South Korea. Uh, they use a lot uh, our terms on board of their of their um, satellites, and we have a very good uh, relationship with them. Um, well, for the future, uh, our terms needs to keep improving. Uh, so the idea is to extend the qualification to additional processors and boards, uh, harm processors, uh, risk five, the qualification of asymmetrical multiprocessing with intercore communication, implementation and qualification of the memory management unit, uh, time partitioning, and as I mentioned before, qualification in Bell A for human missions. Um, so this is this would be a huge step also for our terms, general our terms because. Nowadays, there are already a few versions of RTEMS, not all of them as performant as RTEMS improvement, um, but uh, still, um, it's, it's, it's a huge uh, step forward. Well, another area uh, that we have been working, sorry, um, it's uh, satellite development. And here, I would like to briefly uh, mention the Aeros constellation. Uh, the Eros is um, a satellite that is going to be launched uh, early next year or well, uh, early March next year. Um, it has several payloads on board. One of our uh, partners uh, in, in the consortium is exactly Spinworth, uh, who has previously also made a presentation about the, the, 
hyperspectral imager, which we, which will be on board of, of the satellite. Uh, it's a, a small satellite, a CubeSat, uh, with a mass of uh, five kilograms, three uh, U. Um, so it's a three U CubeSat, um, and it is basically uh, a platform to test several uh, developments, several technologies, and it is mainly for uh, research and development. So the data that will be uh, collected and, and, and available uh, from the satellite will be available to the community uh, and uh, several ser services can come up from, from, from its sensors and from the data gathered by the satellite. This is a short view of the satellite, the integration, well, in, in this case, before the integration and the several parts of the satellite. Um, okay, and I will now pass to the ground systems. Uh, so um, naturally, we have uh, the satellites, we have lots of data at the satellites, but we need to bring it down. Uh, we need to make it available for users. Uh, and that's our mission uh, as a ground systems operator. Okay. Um, so what we do, we have a teleport uh, in Santa Maria. We perform daily operations, uh, daily site operations. Um, we support space missions and space operations. And these include not only, uh, let's say, the, the, the living satellites uh, on space, but also uh, launch operations. So we do support, for instance, to ESA, um, from their launch from, from French Guiana, but we also support other, let's say, new space operators that uh, operate in the launch um, uh, market. Okay. Um, we do ground systems hosting and maintenance, so we don't have only our systems at the teleport, but we also host uh, other entities, other companies, uh, other partners' uh, systems uh, at the teleport. And uh, we also perform space surveillance and tracking engineering. Um, so like the flight software systems, we design, implement, host, maintain, and support operations uh, of, of, of space systems. We operate basically in the new space uh, for ground systems. Uh, so it's a little bit different from, let's I don't like to call it whole space, but the traditional uh, ground systems uh, operations. Um, so we provide support to any satellite and or any constellation that is in our field of view. Um, these are some of our teleport activities. As I mentioned before, launchers tracking, uh, Earth observation. So we downlink the data that George uh, previously mentioned. Uh, we downlink the data and we process the data locally uh, and we provide the value-added products um, to the customers. Uh, engineering, operations, maintenance, data communications relay. Uh, so basically we have their available infrastructure in a very geostrategic position um, to serve space missions. Okay? Um, several assets that you can see here and also uh, Many, many customers, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, not only national, but mostly uh, international customers uh, from worldwide. Um, what allow us to do this? Well, the human factor is, is a paramount. So we have a team, a local team, uh, people from Azores that live in Santa Maria, work there, uh, and they love, love their job. Um, and they are the ones who support us and our customers on a daily basis. Um, we have their 24-7 uh, uh, security. Um, so the site, the teleport hosts uh, uh, Galileo Sensor Station. The Galileo Sensor Station are critical European infrastructures. Uh, which one, demands one us, minute, please. Okay. Which demands us to have um, permanent security and uh, the National Security Office audits permanently. Also local uh, external support services. So everyone, it's a small island, so everything is very close by. And the location, a very geostrategic, low noise RF, which is very important, and plenty of area for expansion. Okay? So let's say we don't have too much limitations. As you can see here, 
Um, this is more or less our footprint uh, on the top right, uh, the footprint, average footprint for Leo. And on the, um, on the bottom right, you can see more or less the GeoArc uh, visibility. So you, we don't have um, natural obstructions. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, George already showed this uh, picture. But you can hear, see here more or less who are the customers uh, and uh, what kind of assets we have there. Okay. So this is how the teleport evolved since 2007. And still today, we keep evolving. Uh, we already have plans for 20, 2024 and 2025 for, for expansion with several customers. Um, and we are doing our plans for the next 10 years um, because uh, mostly due to this antenna, this, this 50 meter antenna, uh, which is a huge asset, it's unique in Portugal, and it allows us to provide support services from launch tracking services up to Leo Geo and let's say uh, near uh, lunar operations and almost Mars operations. So, Finally, um, SST, the Space Surveillance and Tracking Area, we also um, have these kind of services. So we operate uh, the National Operations, Operational Center at Terceira Island. Um, the, national, the, the national SST network comprises several optical sensors, telescopes, which we operate there uh, every night. Um, and we have also developed uh, a front end um, Sorry, uh, we, has, we have also developed a front end, um, which aims to be used as a portal uh, for external stakeholders uh, and contribute to widening the usage of SST information. So we have the satellites, we need to know where they are, uh, what maneuvers can be done, what are the risks of collision, uh, what are the re-entries, uh, the predicted re-entries, um, and uh, also other say, uh, events that can happen in space. Um, this can be an interesting alternative for expensive licensed software. Um, naturally, you need to have access to a database, uh, but the front end is very uh, intuitive uh, and very useful uh, for, for the, well, the customers or whoever uses this kind of software. So with this, I just gave you a, a broad idea what, what we do, what we can do. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry for eventually delaying a little bit. Well, thank you so much, uh, João. Uh, this was a very interesting uh, presentation.